So now let us look at the problem at hand, which is a one dimensional cavity. So what I have is my axis Z. Along this axis, I have put in two mirrors of radii R1 and R2. Right? So this is my mirror one, then this mirror two. Each one of them has got a radii which is R1. This mirror might have a radii R2. And the distance between them is L. So now let us see how we can write the problem of the field bouncing back and forth within such a system using the ABCD matrix. So what I will do is basically I will go through this cavity in a single round trip and then figure out uh, how to write that in, a, uh, in the ABCD matrix language. So let me begin here. This is my step number one. I go around to the other direction. I travel a free space distance of L. So this matrix I am writing as the ABCD matrix corresponding to free space propagation of a distance L. Right? When I reach the location 2, what I do is I write down the matrix associated with the reflection from the mirror number 2. So which I can write it in this fashion, which is the matrix corresponding to the mirror number 2. So I have 1, 0, 2 by R2 with a minus sign, right, and 1. So this is my matrix at the location 2. From here, so let me call this the let me call this location now 3. I travel back the distance L again in free space to reach the location 4, which again I capture through a free space propagation matrix. And again at 4, what I experience is a reflection from the mirror. Let me call this location 5. And that 5 is identical to the location 1 where I started with. So I can write this out as arising out of the first mirror which is 1 0 minus 2 by R1 now. One. This by the way is the ABCD matrix that will determine my let's say input Ri and Ri prime at the point 1 to Rf and Rf prime at the point 5 which by the way is identical to the point 1. This matrix is between 1 to 2, right? This matrix is taking you from 2 to 3, which is the mirror matrix. This matrix is taking you from 3 to 4, which is from 4 to 5 is taking you this matrix. So this is precisely what my problem is. Uh, what I want to do now is analyze this matrix which I am calling as the general ABCD matrix for a single round trip. Now if the ray goes through multiple round trips, so imagine that the ray undergoes n round trips, then I need to multiply these matrices, this set of matrices n times. That would mean I need to take the power n for this matrix and that will give me the r for my at the beginning which is my 0th round trip for my starting point to my nth location which is rn 
and R n prime, which is the location which is characterizing the ray after n round trips. n is the number of round trips within such a cavity. One quick point to realize that the determinant of individual matrices is 1 of any of these matrices is 1. That is, determinant is simply AD minus BC for the 2 by 2 matrix and that is 1. Now this this matrix M which I am writing down which is the final matrix which is the nth power I expect you to go home and multiply these four matrices and see and this is of this so let me now look at it more carefully so imagine I am now relating the mth pass through the through such a cavity let's look at the So I can write down my R M plus 1th location as arising out of the same matrix where A, B, C, D are these uh, elements which are already identified above. B times R M prime. Similarly, the R M plus 1th slope is given by C times Rm plus D times Rm prime. This is what has happened in the mth round trip wherein the initial position and slope Rm, Rm prime are related to the Rm plus 1 and Rm plus 1th prime position after for that particular pass. Right? So this is my equation number 1. I'll start numbering them. This is my equation number 2. Now you see I can eliminate uh, for example the slopes right so I can write down R M plus 2 as arising out of A times R M plus 1 plus B times R M plus 1 prime. You know clearly that R M plus 1 prime can be written as right from the above from equation 2 can be written as C times Rm plus D times Rm prime and you'll also see that my Rm prime itself can completely be eliminated using equation 1 which is R, so you look at equation 1, which is Rm plus 1 minus A times Rm divided by B. Right? So what I have done here is I am eliminating the Rm plus 1 and I am looking, I am eliminating Rm prime, so I am eliminating all the primes so as to write down an equation that is relying only on the location and not the slopes. So in the end, I essentially obtain the following equation that my R M plus 2 equals 
a plus d you can clearly see a plus d would contain the rm element a plus d r m plus 1 and then minus so you have f times I'm just writing it as f tell you what that times r m which is the second term and you will see that I can easily identify my f as a times d minus b times c so my f is clearly the which by the way is clearly equal to 1 so here is our final equation we have now developed all the ammunition required to look at the stability of the field inside the cavity so what I have done uh, most importantly is to get rid of all the slopes associated with the rays and all that we have got left with is displacements uh, the later displacement from the optical axis of the cavity right so this is where uh, a physical ansatz come into play one has to think about what will make the cavity stable so I make the following ansatz that is I assume such a solution the ansatz is so that is my mth r mth uh, displacement inside the cavity is simply r naught which is my initial displacement uh, before the round trips began times x to the power of m and my expectation is that that my x is such it's a number such that mod x is one unity so you can clearly see as it takes various powers of m so given that x is such a number you will see that it clearly amounts to x at the most contributing to sort of a phase factor any higher power of m is going to continue to make it remain just a phase factor and hence you see that even after round trip the displacement of the wave away from the the displacement of the ray away from the optical axis is at most governed by the initial displacement chosen and it is not going to increase in time and hence the ray if we can find solutions of this kind then after m round trips the ray would remain confined within r naught at most with a phase factor which depends on the number of round trips it has taken clearly you see that this is a very very important step in this analysis that I could not have got a condition on for example the slope of the ray because moment you have a non-zero slope right I am I will be if I have a finite non-zero slope as m increases the slope will keep on increasing because it's a finite slope only for zero slope rays will I be able to confine light in here when I am putting a constraint on the lateral displacement I have ensured that I am free to choose whatever is the slope that is the manner in which the light rays propagate um, less to, left to be determined all of them can contribute to a stable mode but what one is constraining is the maximum lateral displacement of the ray right so let me just pictorially uh, emphasize this just a little bit that let's say I got my two mirrors and my field profile can be such you know maybe of this kind so you see that if I represent rays now the ray is pointing for example horizontally or along the axis here the ray is pointing further away so it's got a positive slope this has got a negative slope and we expect that such modes such field distributions are reasonably allowed so you see that one cannot one could not have put constraint on the slope of the ray so what we have done the next best thing that one can do is to put a constraint on the extent of lateral displacement itself which basically limits 
how far away the R naught can be, right? The original uh, launch of the field and hence the appropriate mode. So we are looking for solutions of this equation, right? Given that this is the answers or the assumption that this is the form of the solution that we want, such a way that that the magnitude of x, as mentioned here, is at most one. Right. So let us uh, do that and plug this answers back into this equation and see what we get. X to the power of m plus two minus a plus d x plus x to the power of m equal to 0. So this is the equation you get. You can clearly see that I can I can divide this equation by x to the power of m and what I would get is a quadratic equation in x which is x square minus a plus d plus 1 which is equal to 0. Now see for such a quadratic equation I can quickly write down the solution so the solutions are going to be x is going to take a value a plus d by 2 plus minus square root of a plus d that is b square minus 4ac 4 times a times c divided by the square four factor that goes in right so this is these are the two possible solutions that such a x can take in order to ensure that x is just a complex number of unit magnitude what i do i take this negative sign you know common outside so what i get is of this kind which is a plus d by 2 plus minus i square root of 1 minus a plus d by 2 whole square is going to be my solutions now you can clearly see i have got a constraint if this square root gives me a real number then you see i can rewrite this complex number in the form of cosine phi plus minus i times sine phi right so these have to be real quantities such a way that this value is less than one in that situation i will be able to write this x as simply unit magnitude i phi plus minus i phi so you can clearly see that's going to be extremely useful so the constraint that constraint i am expressing as a plus d by 2 this quantity is mod should be less than or equal to 1 right so you can clearly see that if I put in such a constraint, both these parts, that is, I will have, I will clearly have my a plus d by 2 would be less than 1, right? That will can be represented as cosine of some angle. And similarly, this square root will turn out to give me a quantity which is less than 1, right? And it's going to be a real quantity. That will ensure that I can write down my x as a exponential plus minus i phi of unit magnitude. So uh, I go ahead and write down what my cosine phi. So for a real angle phi, what I get is that phi should be cosine inverse of a plus d by 2 and my sine phi also would be 
1 minus a plus d by 2 whole square. So if I now I identify what my a and d are, so a and d for our matrix are essentially this is my quantity a for my round trip matrix and this is the quantity d. So I had to look at a plus d by 2, put them together and make sure that the values lie between the constraints plus minus 1. Right, so I can write down in the following form is plus 1 to minus 1. So this is our equation of constraint. If we choose the distance between the mirrors and the radius of curvature R1 and R2 in such a manner that this equation is this constraint is satisfied, in that case I would basically get a stable cavity. Okay, so let me just rewrite this in a slightly different manner. Let me add 1 to all of these terms. So what I get is 0, 2 minus 2L by R1 minus 2L by R2 plus 2L square R1 R2 and this is less than or equal to 2. So you'll see that I can divide this whole equation by 2, right? And what I get is essentially this becomes my criteria for stability, which is 1 minus L by R1 into 1 minus L by R2. So this becomes my condition for stability of the cavity. Right? I hope you have got the idea and the approach. It's very important that we understand the physical elements that are required when, whenever we do mathematics. Uh, we understand the physical inputs that are required at the crucial stage to get to a, a, a physically realizable solution of the problem. Right? So in that sense, mathematics is a powerful tool uh, which can bring us a lot of insights. So let me look at this criteria uh, graphically so that we understand physically what we are doing. So so let me draw this stability diagram. So what I'm doing is let me first identify this and uh, let me call this as G1. This is a parameter, two parameters G1 and G2. And uh, what I'm doing is I'm going to plot G1 and G2 on this graph. And I know that the product of these two quantities. So how do I vary G1 and G2? I basically vary the quantities uh, either L or R1 and R2. And to vary them independently, I'll have to vary basically the radius of curvature of the uh, two mirrors. So you see, the product of this is contained within 0 and 1. So you see, what I would get is like that in a graph which is like that. These are these graphs are symmetric, right? Uh, whereas where these points is basically 1, 1 on either of these points of uh, closest approach, if you like, this is minus 1, minus 1. That this hashed region, right? This is the stable region. That is, if I choose parameters which are contained within this hashed region, you know, within the shaded region, so these are stable. And every region outside this, right, every region outside is unstable. Right? So now let's just look at, uh, for example, if I use two plane mirrors. Right? So we will do this one by one. Let's look at a few examples. Two plane mirrors. Uh, if I have two plane mirrors, what would be the radius of curvature of each of them? That would be infinity. Right? So you see that what I have is irrespective of the radius of curvature and any length L doesn't matter. What I will basically stay on this point 1, 1. Right? 
this is the location of the planar mirror cavity and clearly we see that such a cavity is on the border of being stable and unstable right any small disturbance can actually make this cavity unstable so this this cavity such uh, such a choice of parameters for a cavity makes it uh, critically stable right right it's at the boundary of stable and unstable now you can look at another situation so i have two concave mirrors such a way that the radii of curvature right this is r1 and similarly this is r2 let's say so r1 and r2 are equal to l the center of curvatures of the mirrors lie on the opposite mirror right so these you can clearly see that for such a situation i would get that these two quantities are zero zero and you see that this essentially forms that little parameter is what ensures that this is again very critically uh, stable in the sense that any small perturbation can take the rays out of such a cavity so you have the third situation where if i choose my l to be such that it is 2 times r1 which is equal to 2 times r2 if i use such a possibility right that would mean that my cavity mirrors have equal radii of curvature right and the separation between them is precisely l so essentially these two mirrors are part of a larger sphere right and you see that such a condition will basically make me land up here which again is critically stable so so you see clearly i can use my now various radii of curvature uh, and you know come up with a rather stable cavity so for the helium neon laser that you see in lab right there what is used is a, a plano concave mirror kind of a cavity right one of the mirrors is for example so for the helium neon laser in your lab so what one usually have is a plano concave sort of cavity right where the l is chosen such a way that l is much smaller than the radius of curvature of the mirror right so one mirror has got infinity right the other mirror has got r which is much greater than l so you see that you will quickly uh, for such a cavity you will lie in this this region right such a region you would lie because you are chosen your r to be much larger than l so i clearly see uh, that one can one can look at the stability of the cavities by simply arranging the radius of curvature as well as the distance between the two um, the two mirrors uh, appropriately and one can get all combinations of possibilities uh, for the stability and ag again let me emphasize unstable cavities are as important as stable cavities for high power lasers uh, but that is a discussion that i will leave it uh, for some other time uh, the other important thing is that all this we are talking about is okay, it has got to do with the longitudinal propagation we are confining the light in the direction of propagation the the next thing which i am going to talk about is actually the transverse confinement if you recall we have a very clear that we require a cavity which is which is one dimensional and indeed that means that we cannot have the field extended all over infinity the field in the transverse direction is going to be finite and how does one look at the modes of such a transverse field is what is going to be the uh, subject of discussion in my next uh, lecture thank you